Stephen? Stephen, are we good? Okay, um, so I'm uh, Ron Pressler, technical lead for Project Loom. Uh, obviously, I'm going to be talking about that today, uh, but also a bit about how uh, OpenJ DK projects are hap happen. Uh, I call this talk uh, Project Loom One Year In. The project is actually a bit older. I'll explain why it's exactly, actually, from my perspective, one year in. First, as uh, Mark Reinhold says, uh, I work for Oracle, so everything I'm going to say is a lie. Uh, uh, but first, a refresher for if there are some of you who don't know what Loom is or uh, have forgotten uh, just why we're doing this. So uh, the goal is to make uh, concurrent programs easier to write. Uh, today, programmers are basically faced with a binary choice. They can either uh, write simple blocking code uh, for example, like servlets, uh, where you have uh, you run a request start to finish in a single thread, uh, and um, the code is nice. The problem is that modern operating systems can manage a far larger number of open uh, TCP sockets than they can uh, run uh, active threads. So that's a scalability bottleneck. Uh, what other people are doing, they care more about scalability, so they write code that's very scalable, but they use asynchronous code with callbacks or completable future or something like RxJava or ACA or all the other uh, asynchronous frameworks. Uh, so it is scalable, uh, but the code is generally um, more complex. More importantly, it's much harder to uh, debug. Uh, it's nearly impossible to profile, uh, and it is pretty much downright impossible to interoperate with existing blocking code. It's very... You can't mix the two. So you either block or you don't. Uh, it's very hard to mix synchronous and asynchronous code. Uh, so we want to take this uh, binary choice away. Uh, and, and basically, the idea is that um, threads are very simple. It's, it's a good abstraction, uh, but their implementation in the OS is insufficient for the, requ the requirements we have. Uh, so we just uh, make more threads. Um, and instead of relying on the operating system to manage them, because it can't for various reasons, um, we have threads in the runtime. We call them, those are lightweight threads. We call them fibers. I may refer to them as lightweight threads as well. Uh, and you can have as many as you want. And the reason that makes, uh, that makes coding easier is that now there's a natural translation from the unit of concurrency of the application uh, which is uh, a session or request or user or maybe an outgoing request uh, to the software unit of concurrency, which is the thread. Um, so it can be a one-to-one -one mapping, which makes writing the code uh, a lot easier. Um, so from the perspective of the user, the user is going to be writing ordinary, simple blocking code, but uh, that's not what the operating system is going to see. The operating is going to see only very few kernel threads, uh, and uh, if you use, if you do any I/O operation, so from the perspective of a programmer, it's going to look like blocking I/O. But from the perspective of the operating system, it's going to get translated automatically uh, to asynchronous I/O. So you get the same scalability uh, benefits of asynchronous code, but the convenience uh, and maintainability benefits of synchronous code. Um, and Rather than just, so uh, one, one of the reasons going to make, we hope, uh, writing concurrent programs easier is not just by uh, having as many threads as you like, uh, but also uh, helping you we weave them together into a sort of a coherent whole. And this is uh, very recent work. Uh, I'm going to get around to it later. Okay, so... Uh, the first thing that has changed since I was here last year is that now we have a prototype uh, that you can try and run. Uh, just go there. Uh, some people are already, already playing with this. And um, also, uh, if you have any questions, so you can ask me. So please ask me during the talk. Uh, maybe I'll tell you uh, that that's a question for later, but uh, just try to ask while I'm talking. So uh, really, Project Loom was first discussed at JVMLS, so it's around August 2017. Uh, and then apparently the process is that uh, 
you're supposed to go around, it's more helpful if it's Oracle because that's where most of the people are, to go internally inside Oracle and find people who want to work on it. Uh, that seemed pretty uh, strange to me at first, but that's the process. Uh, and the very first person right at JVM Less who wanted to join the project was Alan Bateman. Um, so he's sort of co-leading it with me. Uh, and uh, he's doing most of the API design and library work. And uh, so there, back there, we didn't even have a name. Uh, Brian gets came up with the name, uh, I think, a day later. Uh, and uh, so we already had like two people and name. Uh, the announcement to the OpenJDK mailing list came shortly afterwards, but it took, it's a, it's a process, so it took, uh, I think, until October, until uh, it was actually an official project, October 2017. Um, and at that time, Alan already started uh, working on the libraries. Uh, there was nothing yet in the VM, but it was started working on the libraries, getting the I.O. ready for all that stuff. Uh, well, I was thinking about how to implement continuations. So uh, fibers are implemented on top of a more uh, basic primitive in the VM uh, that's called continuations. I'm going to get uh, right to it. Uh, and the VM gives you continuations, and the fibers are implemented on top of them in the libraries. So I had sort of a, an idea on how to do it. Uh, First, uh, let me show you what it looks like. So this is a very partial uh, part of the API. A continuation is basically like a runnable. Uh, let's get back to it in a moment. Uh, so it's like a runnable. It doesn't have any, any notion of running things in parallel. Uh, but it's a special kind of runnable. So it runs in line with your code. You, you, you call it and it runs in line, so nothing in parallel. Uh, but uh, it's special in the following way. Uh, a runnable runs, you start running it, it runs to completion and then returns to the caller. Uh, continuations uh, can call, uh, can do an operation called yield. And when a continuation does a yield, uh, it, returns to the call, it returns to the caller. And the next time the continuation is run, instead of starting at the beginning, it continues from the yield point. Uh, so continuations are very, very low level. You're not supposed, application developers are not going to use them directly. You're going to use uh, Constructs are built on top of them, higher level constructs. One of them is fibers. Uh, but if you were to use them, you do them like this. Uh, you create a continuation. I'll explain what the scope is. Uh, and then uh, let's say you have this infinite loop uh, that occasionally yields. And so this is your sort of runnable continuation. And then you way, the way you run it is as long as it's not done, and it's going to be done when uh, the, that runnable has actually terminated, uh, but as long as it's not done, you're going to run it again. And every time you run it, it's going to continue at the yield point. Uh, a couple of important points here. Uh, this yield, in this case, it is actually uh, in the top level lambda expression, uh, but it can be deep in the stack, uh, so it can be nested in some, some other method. And the scope, uh, that mysterious scope parameter, uh, that is what allows us to nest multiple continuations inside one another. And when you yield on a certain scope, it basically tells you which of the callers to return to, kind of like uh, throwing an exception uh, with multiple handlers. So you can go back. Uh, so when you yield, you can go back to the immediately enclosing continuation, or if you're inside several continuations, you can jump to the one. Uh, you return to the caller that created the continuation with that scope. So this is the um, a part of the API. Uh, so we have the constructor, we have run, we have is done and yield, that's what we saw. And right at the beginning, uh, so even when I was here last year, we knew that we're going to have some uh, technical limitations. Um, one of them is that, uh, so the continuation when you yield, it, it must remember its state. So next time when you run it, uh, it, it has to know where to continue. And you can be several methods deep, so part of that state is a stack. So a continuation needs to remember the stack. Uh, and we wanted to move stacks around, and that is something that you cannot do uh, if you have native frames. Uh, so basically, a continuation has its own stack, and when you run it, we say that you mount the continuation. So conceptually, you can think of it as if you take uh, the continuation stack and append it to the thread stack, and when you yield or unmount it, you take that portion of the stack and move it to the side. Uh, so if you happen to have a native frame, on the continuation stack, 
for example, you, you're inside a continuation, then you call out to JNI. From JNI, you call back into Java, and then you do a yield, so you have a native frame on the stack. In that case, we say the continuation is pinned. It cannot be yielded. Um, and when that happens, when you try to yield, uh, then this method is going to be called, which by default throws an exception. Fibers do something else. So we knew about that limitation uh, even last year when I was here. Uh, so this is what we had. Uh, but this is a slide I show you. You see the styling is different. This is uh, the slide I showed here last year. Um, so the requirements are that we're going to need millions of continuations, uh, and that means that the uh, footprint of each uh, continuation must be very low, uh, and we need a very fast task switching. Uh, so we can, we can mount and unmount continuations very quickly. And I said that conceptually, uh, you can think of it as if taking the stack of the continuation and appending it to the thread. Uh, so we thought, okay, so if that must be very fast, we shouldn't do any copying. Uh, so it's just conceptual copying, uh, but the easiest thing to do was just point the stack pointer to uh, wherever the continuation stack is. Uh, and I showed you a whole thing of how to do it uh, here at JFocus. Uh, and uh, the very next day, uh, the, so th here in the Stockholm office, there are a lot of uh, the GC people, and they basically told us that uh, this cannot be done. Um, and actually, John Rose was here, and both he and I were kind of depressed about this for a few days. Uh, and so uh, what I mean by cannot be done, cannot be done with, you know, under a few years of work. Another slide I showed you, uh, we had some ideas of where to store the continuations stack, uh, either on the Java heap uh, or some, some parts of the C heap. Uh, and also, we didn't know back then uh, if we were to store the continuation stack on the heap, um, there we had two options of how to do it. Uh, either maintain the same layout of the stack as it is normally for threads, uh, and but then it means that the references, uh, or what we call in the hotspot, oops, uh, can be anywhere on the stack. So we need to have an OOP map to tell the GCs, uh, the, G, uh, the, the various GCs in Hotspot where to find the OOPs. Uh, and the other was to separate the primitives and the references to different arrays. Uh, so after a lot of discussions with the GC people, literally the next day after I gave the talk, uh, they also said that that couldn't be done. Uh, so we've decided to go with this. Uh, and like I said, we were very uh, sad that we couldn't do it without copying. So we said, OK, let's do copying and, and, and figure it out later. Um, so this is how, uh, in the current prototype, continuations work. Uh, it starts with copying, but then I'll show you uh, a cool trick that we came up with. Um, so let's say this is a native stack. This is the ordinary thread stack. Uh, you call run on the continuation, and you now enter the continuation. Uh, you're going to, uh, internally, there is an internal continuation method called enter, and then it's going to run your runnable, uh, and those would be the frames, and eventually uh, you want to call yield. So when you call yield, uh, it's going to call into the VM, into a, a native method in the VM called freeze, and what freeze is going to do is going to start copying the frames to the continuation stack that's stored on the ordinary Java heap. Uh, so it's going to copy this frame. And then, uh, so while it's copying, it also has to examine whether the, uh, the frame is, for example, a native one, uh, in which case you're pinned. Uh, and uh, if it isn't, uh, it's going to continue copying them. So first it copies the continuation as is with all the references inside into the so stack is the primitive array, and ref stack is the reference array. That's the object array. Uh, and then it extracts the oops from that frame and copies them to the reference stack. Uh, and it does that for all the frames. Uh, one thing I forgot to change in the slides that we recently changed. So I, I showed how it copies. Uh, so this is called the top of the stack. Uh, how it copies from the top of the stack down. Actually, now we change the order. It copies them in the other direction, but the same idea. And then freeze is going to jump back to run, um, and that's it. Uh, 
And when we want to continue the continuation, the next time we call run, uh, so it recognizes the continuation already has some internal state. Uh, so it calls enter again, but now recognizes that there is something there, so it's going to call something called do continue. And that is going to copy uh, the frames. It's going to make some room on the stack. And it copies uh, the frames in the other direction. So first it copies the frame as is. Uh, it restores the oops to the right place because the, the GCs may have moved the objects around. Uh, and as long as they're on the object stack, the GC uh, knows where to find them. And uh, if they're relocated, it fixes all the uh, pointers. Uh, so we have to restore them to, to uh, their new values. And we also have to uh, patch the frames so that uh, some sort of metadata on each of the frames to make sure that they know how to return to the right place. And uh, we do that to the rest of the frames. Uh, and then we return into yield. So uh, the conceptual idea of copying the frames uh, portion of the stack is actually uh, what we're doing. However, that is not what we wanted to do. Uh, we didn't want to copy anything. And the problem with this is, is the following. Let's say you have the cost of this is linear in the depth of the stack that you have. Uh, it is very uh, much possible that you'll be like 100 methods deep uh, in a very tight loop around yield. But every time you yield, you have to copy those 100 frames back and forth. So the, the amount of work is linear in your total depth of the stack. And, and that, is, that can be very bad. So Eric Duvblad from the Stockholm office here came up with an idea. And that was what we implemented uh, in the prototype. And uh, that the idea is called lazy copy. Uh, so the, the first time we freeze or we yield the continuation, we do the copying uh, as I showed you, but that's only the first time. Uh, next time we want, to, uh, we want to continue the continuation, uh, what we're doing is uh, we're just going to copy, so this is the same as before, uh, we're just going to copy one or two frames. So now this is a constant, more or less a constant time operation. It's not dependent on the depth of the stack. We just copy one or two frames. Uh, and then what we do is that we change the return address of this frame uh, and replace it with a pointer to a bit of code that we call the return barrier. And if you run, and then we return to 